Okay, hello everybody. Welcome back to this channel. This is Theory Craft. My name is Jack. Over there is Ben, where we like to talk about theories. General rants, rave, come up with ideas, interesting theories. And if you're interested in this channel, then please consider subscribing. If you haven't watched any of our videos before, as I said, we like to ram, rave, and talk about utter nonsense, but also quite intelligent theories, thoughts, and responses as well. If you haven't watched our videos, then please watch all of our videos. Please send us presents at the address, which will be in the link in the description below. But we're going back from the New Mutants episode that we did a few weeks ago. So we went through a whole spitball on that, which was going to be uh, casting the film, going to be talking about plots and so on, what kind of characters we wanted to see in New Mutants, except the General, the Wolverine, the Cyclops, the Storm, are having some of those main characters still in there, but we're going to be getting into the whole meat and potatoes of this thing, into this massive spag bowl of mutants. I have no idea what I am saying. But anyway, let's just get into this one. And this is going to be new, and this is going to be the new mutants casting. So let's get ready to rant. So yes. off we go. Okay, so <laughs> new mutants. We did the whole thing a few weeks ago where we had the general main list of actors that we wanted to know we wanted to see um and characters and so on but obviously it's going to be coming down to whittling it down for obviously the uh the big film which is going to be the big series and so on so if we're going to have this massive conglomerate conglomeration of characters obviously we got the main ones few side characters and some we haven't seen before so if we're going to get straight into casting might as well just cast the main ones which we already have and work away from there. So does that sound good? Yeah, sounds perfect, dude. Let's get ready to rant. Yes. Right. So first one that we so first one that we had, we'll get, generally kind of get through these a little bit quick, and then we'll add our forward same roundabout at the end. So we had the first one for Mister Sinister, main pro, main antagonist for the main character. Which well, you actually suggested a completely different voice altogether, and it's funny enough how these two suggestions uh, met in the middle, because your first suggestion was uh, James L. Jones from Lion King and lots of other very blockbuster films, such as well, Lion King, obviously the voice of Mufasa. But why did you why did you want to come up with that one at first? Well, James L. Jones for me was obviously Darth Vader, and. Mm. The whole point is, like, he's got a very deep and booming voice that's sinister, but not pure evil, if that makes sense. Yes. And that's why it worked best for Mr. Sinister, not because just because he was called Mr. Sinister, but because right. Mr. Sinister, as a character as a whole, is a very odd one. The thing is, as I've said to you before, when it comes to mutants... It's very rare that there is a definitive bad guy. Like they wax and wane because of what mutants are. More often than not, yes. they are misunderstood. So there aren't any definitive bad guys because, as they've shown in the latest comics, everybody's in harmony with one another on the island of Krakoa. So at least if you had like a voice of James L. Jones, so it wasn't so obvious that he was the bad guy it would make things a bit more intriguing yes so well, by the way a little bit of a side fact as well for anybody who somehow has not worked this one out yet or even guessed or researched it james l jones voice of mufasa but is also the voice of darth vader in case you didn't know somehow so if we're going to go from lion king james l jones i came up with a suggestion which I think we both agree kind of fits very well with the voice and obviously for the character of Mr. Sinister himself, considering where he's from, but the voice of Jeremy Irons, or mm. i.e. Scar from Lion King. So, yeah, like, I mean... For, for just, for this, just for this voice, just because of like the mannerisms, like how evil like of a character which he can play, but not just in that, even in... Um, I remember watching him, he was in Pink Panther 2, Jeremy Irons, when he was... Basically, the main synopsis of the film was that they're trying to catch this jewel thief called the Tornado. And basically, Jeremy Irons character is accused of being uh, the Tornado. And he plays kind of this evil, kind of snobby, like posh character. And he just plays just an evil villain so well that if you ever see him playing a good guy, it's just so odd. It's just so strange. But also, he, for me, just has I can't really consider any other voice apart from um, Jeremy Irons. Although, I remember at first I did suggest Christopher Walken. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it could kind of work, but the thing is, 
He, how old is he now? What he's got to be late seventies, easily. Christopher. Oh, right about that. While he is an interesting actor, it's hard to try and use someone in that age group for a character that is so so well known within the mutant community yes. that they'd have to be a bit younger by like ten years, give or take. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, excuse me. But there we go. So, yeah, we have Mr. Sinister down as our main antagonist, either voiced by James L. Jones or Jeremy Irons. Yeah, so we're going to like, we're gonna shift on just a little bit from there. Please excuse Ben, just while he blows out the rest of his brain cells through his nostrils. <laughs> and the minute his brain's melting from all the knowledge and all the ideas which he's had through the functioning of new mutants in his mind. So it's all mm. starting to come out every orifice. But, um... If we're going to move on to, obviously, we've got to have the main characters in there, like some main ones, which we already know, maybe Cyclops, Storm, which is a bit of an bit of an iffy one because the, we're not too sure if she's going to be in the new Black Panther or not as of yet. I mean, I can see the idea of her popping up because her and T'Challa did have a massive relationship. But at the same point, it's hard to try and justify that she's always been around in the mcu this is the biggest issue we've had with mutants as a whole is trying to fit them chronologically because we can't just go oh yeah they just now they're here like that doesn't make a good enough excuse like no i mean i got this horrible feeling that's probably the way it's going to go but at the end of the day it would be nice to have a bit more of an explanation yeah, for sure. I mean, if we're going to have Storm uh, back in the fold for this one, I would still... It was only... I don't even think it was really referenced in the original films, but I would still want her ex very much portrayed as the goddess that she is. Like she, was, like she was thought of as a goddess by her people back in yes. Africa. Well, the thing that I found really bizarre is that when it was the Halle Berry, uh, Halle Berry version... She didn't even attempt an African accent. Well, she did attempt the African accent at first, and then she just gave up in the last two Yeah, films. but that's my point. It's the fact that how disrespectful is it to not even attempt or even try to do the accent of your own ancestors, technically? I mean... Yeah. I mean, at the very least, at least when it was the newer trilogy where you got the younger version of Storm... The actress actually did do a pretty decent job. Yeah. Although I did find it very bizarre that they reworked her origin in such a sense that she just gained like a massive power surge from Apocalypse and that was it. Like, that doesn't work like that. No, definitely not. But. I'm trying to think of a female African American actress that is well known enough to be able to do the job because I know everybody watching this is going to hate me for this but I'd still want Halle Berry back <laughs> yeah I, to a degree it would be good but the problem I'm sorry, is I know all of you will hate me for that I'm sorry but the problem is is like I don't know if it's going to be the excuse that they could the easily but then again, it depends with which age mutants we're going for. Are we going to go for the ones that are in the first load of films, or are we going to go for the younger ones that, for some reason, there's some weird time jumps and they're different ages in different years and it doesn't make sense? Well, my hope is that we are going to have all of the original X-Men the same age group. Yeah. Because, obviously, in the original movies, Rogue was a lot younger, which I didn't understand when you had the 90s cartoon series where they were all, what, in their mid-20s, give or take? Right about then, yeah. Or and just, then Xavier's or like... Very, an, or just kind of early-ish teenagers, but yeah. like maybe 16 around there. Well, the thing is, well, it's like, so you've got Scott and... So, Scott and Jean and Beast as well as Storm, all in yeah. their like early 20s or whatever. So they're the teachers. Xavier, I would always have to have like at least another five to ten years older because, of course, that's the point. He's meant to be yes. an older gentleman. So 
Yeah, that's why, like, for the like for X Men First Class, his age just doesn't make sense if you compare it to the first trilogy of films. True, but at least it was a different class of X Men. Well, though you can discount Wolverine because he's older than all of them. Yeah, but Wolverine doesn't really matter anyway because technically, <laughs> I mean, he's like at least a hundred years old, give or take. Oh no, older? No, he's older than that. Yeah, I suppose he is. There's a car. I can't remember how old was he when he died. I because I researched this not long ago. I think he was right about 140 something, or I could be wrong. Right about there. Yeah. Yeah, something along those lines. So Wolverine is going to be the easiest one to cast because logically it doesn't matter what age, but physically you'd want him again about twenty-five to thirty. So at least. And you came up with a very interesting suggestion, which didn't even cross my mind. So who did you come up with? I can't remember who it was now. It's so long ago. We had Kingsman. Oh yes, Edgerton. Now I I know a lot of people are going to think who the. Fudge, do you think you are picking and the, him? And the, and the people that do know are going to be like, oh, for God's sake, really? <laughs> but the thing is, this dude has done quite a lot of random movies in the past five years, but he does go into his roles very well. He, like, is, he is a brilliant actor. He is brilliant. <laughs> but it's like, you look at the differences between Kingsman, Rocket Man, and Eddie the Eagle, and he does become those people. Like, Yes, yeah. I mean, the the funnier thing is, it's like all he really needs is mutton chops, and he's literally Wolverine because he's got the right. He's not that tall, which is good because that's the point. Wolverine is for everybody who's wondering like what I'm on about. Wolverine is actually one of the shortest characters in yeah, Marvel. He's he, actually yeah. shorter than Spider Man. He's only five foot five. Yeah, because like and like Hugh Jackman's like six foot two, six foot three. Yes. Which makes me laugh because I think what they had to do for the majority of his they scenes is like they had very like awkward camera angles to make him look shorter. Yes, but I think they also for the guy that originally played Cyclops have to give him lifts because he was a lot shorter. I think he was only five seven, so he had to have lifts in his shoes. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> which because it was kind of like the Liam Neeson syndrome. So I think it was from yeah, the, I think it was like a little bit on a tangent. Yeah, for the first Star Wars film, when you had uh, Liam Neeson, when he was playing Qui-Gon Jinn for that, yeah, what they had to do, they had to spend an extra $150,000 to make the sets taller for him, because he's like Mm. six foot four, six foot five, and plus for certain scenes, I think they had to build a bit of a trench that he could walk alongside the other actors to make him look shorter. Mm. Uh, I'm just sort of going through my notes. Um... But obviously, if we're going to go back to uh, Storm... If you mm. want to have some original characters from where, because uh, a short while ago, me and Ben were watching the old cartoon series, which is absolutely amazing. If you kids have not watched it, you need to watch it. It's the best thing in the world. Yeah, get away from that. You co- get away from that. You copyright robots. <laughs> but yeah, if we're going to go back to the original series, if we have like all the very or like the very young, like lesser known characters. I mean, I'm not going to go on like Colossus or anything like that. But we're going to have little like side characters such as Spike. Who, interesting fact, if you don't know, Spike is the nephew of Storm. Hmm. I mean, I just had a very random thought as to who could play Spike, but I can guarantee you're going to think, "Why the hell have I come got on?" Hit me with it, Jaden Smith. Because he's young enough to sort of be the right age group for him. I can see that. It's just I I just don't understand why in number three why he was being played by uh by an Asian actor. That yeah, make I sense. I couldn't grasp that either. I think it was just the fact that they were trying to sort of fill in the idea of ethnic minority gubbins, which is fair enough. You can do as you but like. Yeah, that's th- that's your right as a role. But it's a bit of an odd one when you've got people like myself and Nerdy Man next to me who know the back history to all these characters. So, I mean, there are probably plenty of Asian characters within the Marvel community that they could have pinched from instead. Yeah. Because at the very least, you could easily just say that it's somebody that Wolverine knew when he was samurai training with his claws. 
because that that's the big thing I think that has been missing from Wolverine. It was only glossed yeah. over in the Wolverine movie, but I would love to see in the new Wolverine, whenever they do do it, him actually doing like fight training with his adamantium claws because it was like throughout the entire saga of his run, he just knew what he was doing. Yeah, but I finally hope we get to see a yellow and blue suit. Oh, yes. Because now, they, they, they had a deleted scene in the Wolverine where he opens yeah. up, then when he opens up the briefcase and it's got like the cowl and everything. Yes. Like, no! I mean, to be fair, Wolverine's costume has always been a very bizarre looking Weird. thing. I mean, <laughs> the thing that it reminds me of, you probably may not know who I'm on about, but here in the UK, we used to have a cartoon series in the 90s of a very, very odd cartoon character known as Banana Man. And yeah, see, Jack knows where I'm going. I like, remember Banana but Man. But the colour scheme of Banana Man was literally the exact same of Wolverine, <laughs> minus the black. Like It yeah. was bright blue, it was bright yellow, and it was the most random design for a costume. I, can't even, I think Banana Man literally just had the powers of, like, Super strength, but also had like an arsenal of bananas in his belt, so he could use it as like slipstream. Like, God, to, I, like, God, I wish I could make a filthy joke, but obviously I'm not going to try to keep it PG. Yes, <laughs> this channel has to work eventually. Yeah, so, <laughs> right, but that's yeah, so that's pretty cool. So Jaden Smith, a suggestion from Spike. Yeah, I mean, like I say, it's an odd choice, obviously, because the Smith siblings are a bit hit in this. But at the same time, he is the right ethnic origin. He is the right age. He probably can act to a degree. I think it's just the fact that the way he's written and the way that he's probably learnt from his parents hasn't always benefited him. No. But it could work. I mean, it's always worth a try. Like, at the end of the day, I can't think of any other African-American actors in the same sort of age group that could no, do I as decent either. a job. And you never know, it just um, might even do a pretty good job, actually. But let's sort of have a think as to who else we want to cast. Um, that bit. Yeah, I was just thinking of him, because while the actor we had for Wolverine Origins was a good guy, Mick Bromner, who also did Magic Mike and is also the guy that plays as Negative Man during the Doom Patrol series, which I've recently got Dean and Jack into watching... Uh, the, yeah, and uh, by the way, Doom Patrol is absolutely brilliant. Obviously, we yeah. can't share very much on here. Some of it's a bit. Yeah, we're going to have to do. <laughs> we will discuss it properly at some point because I've been watching it relentlessly, and D and Jack have only just seen it. Try, yeah, but trying to keep it PG will be hard work. Yeah. <laughs> we have to come up with yeah. like code words just so obvious. So obviously, the robot that so obviously like the robot, the AI that the AI that goes through YouTube videos doesn't go. Oh no, you can't say that. <laughs> Let's just say that it's utter bananas is this TV series. But yeah, that's one way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, it's the politest way I can think. But the the thing that we need with the whole idea with Gambit is for one, French. he needs to have the he needs to be French, but two, he needs the purple eyes because that was the one thing that was missing and. The, uh, well, you need the right suit as well. I'm sorry, but what we got in first uh, Wolverine Origin, sorry, was just piss poor. I mean, you're like, having with like the whole like you kind of like the purple like waistcoat thing had like the headband up the top yeah. up and everything. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I know it sounds an odd idea, but the perfect way to introduce him could be in the next Ant Man movie because Ant Man is a heist guy. And so is Gambit, because he was trained oh. by French um, heist gang. So it'd be a cool interaction, which would also be an interesting way to try and show what he can do by obviously stimulating the kinetic energy in Ant-Man's suit, which could overload it and make him trip out from going... And and small, you have small. all kinds of things, such as pin particles and so on, which would make a really interesting story. I would love to see yes. that. But this is it, like... For, the thing is, is like the mutants as a whole. Yes, they do have. They act like a massive family, but they have their own individual stories, which the other movies seem to gloss over. Yeah, I mean, 
who can you think we can have as Gambit? Because well, I remember we were kind of, I can't remember if we were just saying it as a joke or if we actually kind of meant it, but at first we were kind of thinking just like for the whole cockiness now from Channing Tatum at first. I know, I know, I know people. Calm down in the comments, we know. <laughs> I mean, to a degree, yes, it can work because he does have the physical build, but it's just like... I mean, he is a funny guy, don't get me wrong, because he did do a couple comedy movies with Jonah Hill that was about cops. It was like based on a TV series they had in America years ago. Um, Although, if, like, he only had a very short bit in uh, The Hateful Way. It's one of the um, series of Quentin Tarantino movies. Obviously, you had Django and Change. You had, mm -hmm. um, obviously, you got The Hateful Way. Um, and there's a load of other films which I like, had numbers in them, but I, they just escaped me at the minute. But it was only in the film for a short while where he played a cowboy and he had to have a very strong sort of... Uh, like, southern kind of, accent. Like, southern southern, southern accent, yeah. When he was playing this cowboy. And he can actually do accents pretty damn well. He's actually quite good at them. Yeah. I mean, I would willingly give it a go because at the end of the day, he needs... Because I, it's just like because we've seen there's quite a lot of fan art that's floating about out there of Gambit mm. as, well, trying to take him as Gambit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can work because he does have the right build for Gambit, but it's also... Like I say, he, whether or not he'd be willing to wear the purple contacts because I can guarantee that they would try and CGI his eyes purple, but it doesn't always work, as we saw in Wolverine Origins, where they only did a brief blip where his eyes just flared purple, and that was it. Yeah. But, yeah. So... So on to, so on to the next... Uh, if I can move on to the next one, unless mm. you had something else to say, did you? No, I was going to try and figure out who we can try and cast as the next mutant. Iceman. Now... First of all, because it needs to be someone that's gay, or at least knows how to play a gay man, because the, the, Iceman... Like, the character has to be a homosexual gay man. Has to mm -hmm. be. Because, like, cause first of all, like, we haven't... Like, like you said, we haven't seen that. And it'd be so refreshing to have this kind of diversity, yes. especially in a group like X-Men, because the original Iceman is, in fact, homosexual. Yes, now, I've had two thoughts as to who we could have, but I don't know if you agree with me on it. So, the first I'm one... I'm sure I know one. Well, the first one I was thinking is Neil Patrick Harris, who... I can, he, I can see that. Well, because he is a gay man in the first place, it makes okay, it a lot yeah. easier to go from. No, but I he's all. Yeah. But it's also the fact that when he was playing the character Barney in How I Met Your Mother, he was quite a flam... Despite being overly top straight, because he had to play the, like this player-type character, he was very, very showmanship, which would be quite an interesting twist to use on Iceman, if you see where I'm going. like It could be like he's trying to fight somebody, but it's quite flamboyant and showman-type. Yeah, but then it gives, like, a, it gives a character that not just the... LGBT community can like rally behind, but also everybody as well. We have exactly. a whole new dimension to Iceman, and I think it, especially in today's world, it'd be very much welcome to see a different Iceman. Exactly. But the other actor I thought about, if we were to do it so it's an older version of Iceman, James, the, was it James Mas Masters? James Masterson? The guy that played as Spike from Spike Buffy. Spike Buffy, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's James Masterson. It's only because, yes, I know he's not naturally blonde, but it's the way that he had his hair done as Spike during Buffy. He really reminded me of Spike. I mean, I, I still watch Buffy to this day. I freak, love it. Yes, but it's the styling of that that is so simple to sort of replicate as Iceman because... And just the lever and everything. It just yeah. looked like Iceman. Yeah. I mean, this is it. Like At the end of the day, it's about trying to find somebody because the other thing as well he was in a doctor who spin-off series called torchwood where yes. he played as captain jack hartness's ex-boyfriend from the future so he has had experience playing someone that's gay so it's not out of the realm of possibility for him to know how to come across 
Because the one thing I find, despite not being gay myself, I do see when you see a straight actor play a gay person, it's too obvious. Yeah. Like, the thing that frustrates me is that you can always tell that they go too over the top. And it always reminds me of Paul O'Grady or um, Judy and Clary, where they're very obviously flamboyant and very, very feminine gay, which is fair enough. But, but at the same point, who's already very comfortable with like being a very out there, proud homosexual man, it would just, oh, I would just love to see this. It just, it's much needed, and it's a yes. whole new side that you you don't see this in action no. films. You don't see this, especially in like X Men or like mm -hmm. any other Marvel, maybe DC film. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only film that we've had so far in the MCU that's actually shown someone to be gay is Valkyrie during Ragnarok, but that was only yes. like a brief blip. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we need a much better rogue than what we've got, because yes. the rogue that we've got was sodding awful. <laughs> it just it goes, every, it goes so far away from the rogue that we know. It's just going, yeah. who is this person? <laughs> I mean, the thing is... Like we said in the previous video, we found fan art of someone having Alexandra Daddario. Put the back in, Ben. But basically, having her as Rogue as this fan art, it looked perfect because all she really needs is a long curly wig. I know it sounds stupid, but if she could find like a very big version of a Tina Turner wig, she'd be set. Yeah. Like, well, you, need, you just need like this sort of random bit of white strip to make it Cruella de Vil style, but that's literally it. I mean, I think she would probably need a bit of training for the accent because Rogue's accent is what is she meant to be Texan or something along those lines? No, I thought she was Canadian. I don't know because I remember in the series she... she was meant. Oh, I don't know anymore. <laughs> I swear, like in the original cartoon series, she's meant to have like a Texan accent, which. Because she calls everyone sugar. Like, she... Yeah. yeah so... Just, oh. But the actress that we had in the original films, a wet blanket would have been more useful. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just... Just a wet fart of a performance. But it's just, like... The thing that uh, always bugged me throughout the entire trilogy that she was in was that she feared her own powers. But the thing is, like... <laughs> that, this but that video was, in itself just ranting about Rogue. <laughs> it's just, it was such a... The only use she had was the fact that she brought in Wolverine to the X-Mansion. That's literally all her, like, use was. Yeah, and just apart from in X-Men 2, like, touching Pyro to put out a fire after, like, he lit up all the police cars and everything, yeah. that was pretty much the only use she had. I mean, the thing that I find hilarious is the fact that she wasn't used much in Days of Future Past, and there is actually a deleted scene where she literally gets found by the rest of them because she's ended up getting captured by the Sentinels to power them all, and then she dies. So That's <laughs> it's literally it. it. But it tells you how unhappy um, this actress um, was being this character. Yeah, because you could, you could just tell being in that role, she just didn't care. No, no, but I think it was mostly down to bad writing because... Because Rogue is one of the best damn characters. Mm. And it's just, would you go as far as like doing the whole kind of... Or would it have to be a completely different story if you're going to do the whole Captain Marvel thing? Well, the thing is, of course, is they reworked her powers in the movies that she literally just siphoned people and that was it. But in the comics, she... Absorbs people's powers, and but she has them for a limited time access, depending on what they are. And also, she could fly as well. Well, that's down to Captain Marvel, because yeah, that's it, what I'm saying. Would you want? Would you go as far as explaining that? In well, yeah. Film, or would you leave it for another one? I would leave it that she is actually like fighting Captain Marvel in Captain Marvel's movie, and that's how she gains her powers. It could be like a mixture right. of flashbacks and stuff, but also like explain in the mutants movie. Right. So it's not all one-sided, but you get the two different perspectives later on. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because I think that's the big thing that could be worth looking into when the mutants do arrive finally in the MCU, 
is the two different perspectives because again that was one other thing that was missing from the original movies was that they were just hunted for being different yes. fine but why are you being hunted like at least when you have the rest of the mcu it makes sense because there's a lot of different people with a lot of different powers and a lot of different responsibilities which explains why they get hunted down because they are feared for being something yeah so it just yeah and it's kind of like when like i tried when i was explaining in the other video about like the inspiration which uh brian singer the director had for magneto and giles xavier the inspiration mm -hmm. which he had was looking at martin luther king and malcolm x she had martin luther king who was holding as you all know was holding peaceful protests you know for black people's rights in america like peaceful protests no violence all that sort of thing and he was like wanting to like really like use his voice to try and convey we want to be heard like when you know we're here we want equal opportunities but then there's malcolm x's uh, approach which was going if you want something you have to go out and take it so there was like fights riots and all that kind of thing seeing that you had to do that to protest like your equal rights and so on and that's kind of the approach which was taken with charles xavier and magneto which yes it does work in that kind of thing but it just kind of felt like that whole story just got kind of a bit bleh, just a bit lost and it yeah just kind of it just felt it just felt really lost and just forced. Yeah, I mean, the thing is as well, is obviously, if, when we do have, like, Magneto and Xavier brought in, the big thing about Magneto, for the very least, is the fact that he was a child in the concentration camps. But considering what time, well, like, what decade we are in in the MCU now is 2023... Uh, it's trying to I, rationalize if he's still if he's still gonna even be alive or not <laughs> well this is the big crux of all of it is are they gonna give us like this crummy excuse that all mutants have longevity to a degree so that's why they it's yeah it's i mean the only thing is as well is like Obviously, we have the whole idea that they can time travel through Marvel. And they showed at the end of Endgame that obviously the past can come to the future as long as they got the device as well. But then does that mean that somehow they go to the past, find the mutant, the mutant gains one of their tech things and they get... This is the thing that's going to bug this me. The, this is the screwy bit about this. Mm -hmm. Because... I said to you, you can't have the X-Men without Xavier, because that's the no, reason why they're called the X-Men. But at the same point, it's trying to sort of bring it all in terms of how they exist within the rest of the MCU, because they can't just magically appear, but they can't no. just magically be hidden for so long. No, because, although we did come up with... We came up with about two or three theories in the previous video which was um one of the suggestions which was that the mutant x gene it like, was um not dying out but kind of in a dormancy kind of stage like mm -hmm. there's a point where we all have certain cells in our body which if they're activated can set off maybe mutations in our genes and our dna and so on which could cause disease and so on so i had like kind of the sense of maybe doing something like that that maybe there has to be a big event which maybe um can cause like mutations in people's bodies that have the mutant x gene you know that kind of thing but then again like you said you can't you can't just say oh they were there because they were always there i mean mm -hmm. if you're gonna have like say if charles xavier is gonna have that whole thing of um just camouflaging all the mutants in the world so they are there but they're not there so, but even just for him without i don't i don't even think cerebro would be powerful enough to do that no i mean the main thing that they've shown within the New Mutant comic book series is that they can revive anybody through the five main... They call it like a five... Well, it's a five-man council of mutants that can revive anybody via a process, and all of their minds are contained within Cerebro, which is an interesting concept, but I am curious as to whether they would use this concept that the mutants just live on Kokoa, and that's how they exist in the MCU. Oh, but like you said, either way, we're not going to be happy with how it no. turns out. Either way. 